I wish uh, you all a very good time of the day, wherever you are. And uh, welcome to this uh, uh, discussion today on a very, very significant initiative and uh, uh, a very, very important uh, uh, asset that we have at the Institute of Chinese Studies. And that is this uh, scholarship that we offer in collaboration with the Harvard Yenching Institute. Uh, ICS, uh, HYI is now, um, uh, I have no doubt, uh, is now a very, very well recognized acronym on the Chinese research circuit in India. And uh, I think uh, we are now uh, looking at a larger and larger pool that uh, that applies to this. Okay, so uh, the objective of this meeting today is to basically get our uh, scholars, uh, uh, the earlier generation scholars uh, from the different cohorts of this uh, scholarship and to come and talk to uh, an audience which I truly hope uh, comes from uh, that pool which is really keenly looking for opportunities to uh, to, to uh, opportunities like this to be able to uh, go to China and uh, then of course uh, Harvard to do some serious um, excellent research. To this audience, I would like to say that what you are going to be hearing now are uh, three or four things. The first you are going to hear is people who have come out from very different streams, who have come out from um, very different backgrounds, but have all been united in their passion for China. They are differently uh, abled and enabled. Some have language, some don't have language, but they get to the language. Uh, but it is their focus on doing research on China uh, either uh, only on, uh, on, on China specifically or comparative kind of uh, uh, research. And that is what really uh, is, uh, is, the, is the common factor binding uh, these people. So when, when uh, they talk to you, they are going to A, talk about their passion for China. So that's really the uh, fundamental uh, drive that we look for. And what this passion then enabled them to go for, uh, how they pursued this passion, uh, how they utilized this ICS HYI uh, scholarship to pursue their research. And uh, then what they have tried to do subsequently after they finished the research. Because the point is not just to, uh, avail of this tremendous opportunity that comes uh, to these scholars. Uh, but having availed of it and having uh, achieved something by it, they reach that point when they have to give back to the system. And that is really the core of the ICS HYI uh, initiative, that it aims to provide opportunities for pursuing excellent research uh, in China and uh, ha at Harvard. And having done that, they then try to see how they can contribute to strengthening uh, the field of China studies in India. That's really the, 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 the sine qua non, as it were, of this scholarship, because what we see in this country is a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of, of uh, lacuna. Uh, in the way in which research is conducted. Of course, in the last 10 years, we have seen a remarkable uh, improvement in the number of courses that have been uh, now, uh, that are being offered across the country, number of centers that are being opened, universities, which are, uh, which, which in one sense uh, is very good news for us because that gives us a bigger pool uh, from which we can uh, draw out our students. But uh, the other problem is that somewhere these are not really leading us to creating that body of uh, scholars uh, who, who are interested in 
in, in serious research. Uh, the other problem, of course, is that uh, a lot of the research in this country is policy driven, policy oriented. And uh, somewhere, um, this has always been, in fact, a point of debate between the ICS and the HYI. Uh, they have uh, always tried to uh, discourage um, very strongly policy oriented kind of research. Uh, because their uh, whole objective is to uh, bring out uh, more theoretical, more conceptual kind of uh, areas and uh, topics. So these are some of the issues that our uh, scholars, and I'm not going to take much more time, and I'm going to come back at the end, but I would like you all to listen to these people very carefully uh, about the kind of themes that I have laid out about you, because make no mistake, this is an opportunity to die for. There is no other scholarship of this kind in the country. You start from here, you go to China, you go to Harvard, you get the best of the both worlds, you come back here, and then you try and see how you can contribute. So it's it's really a it's it's a kind of a holistic uh, experience, and it brings you back in many ways to your fundamentals. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, Veda first. Uh, she is the senior most in this cohort. And uh, uh, Veda, uh, over to you. You all have your briefs. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm not sure how to feel about being called a senior, but um, thank you for inviting well, if it me. Is, if it is any you. consolation, you don't look it. So that's <laughs> 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 okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, it's it's really nice to be back on an ICS HYI panel. Um, some of us had the pleasure of going to uh, Dehradun and to Sikkim and to talk to students in person, which was a really, really lovely opportunity. So I'm hoping that with uh, this going virtual, we're able to reach a broader sort of an audience. Um, so I'm going to break my 15 minutes into three uh, parts, largely. One is a very quick uh, snapshot of the research that I do. And as uh, ma'am mentioned, all of us on the panel here, we're all from different disciplines. So I'm going to try and contextualize what I do within the larger China studies um, field. And then a quick um, uh, five minutes on my experience with the fellowship and particularly how the fellowship has sort of influenced the kind of work that I do today. And then I'll end with, um, which I, what I hope is going to come in five minutes of why you should apply for this fellowship if you are considering it. So within the broader China studies field where uh, I situate my research is let's say broadly and very simply putting it, the study of global China, right? And I'd like to just take a quick second to sort of explain what global China is um, in the words of uh, Professor Ching Huan Li, who wrote this fascinating book called The Spectre of Global China. In that book, in the preface, she says, and I quote, China casts an outsized shadow on many different arenas of world development, challenging the field of China studies to abandon its methodological nationalism so as to catch up with China's transformation into a global force. Studying global China means reimagining China beyond China, connecting, contextualizing, and comparing Chinese development with that in other parts of the world. So the part of the world that I situate my lens is Africa. And this is really fascinating because China's engagement here has been incredibly layered. It's been incredibly complex. And why is that, right? So very simply, because there are so many different Chinas that are active in Africa and different parts of Africa. So there are provisional actors, there are national actors, there are small scale enterprises, there are private entrepreneurs, which means you have state capital coming in, your private capital coming in. A recent paper by Deborah Brottingham stated that in Zambia alone, there were over 18 Chinese financial lending institutions. There are an array of policy banks. And what are all of these different Chinese actors doing? They are building connectivity projects. They are investing in agriculture, in tech, in health. They are buying huge stakes in media houses. They are trying to craft different non-Western Chinese uh, narratives. Um, they are now not only the major trading partner for most countries in the region, they're also a major investor, they're a lender. So the engagement is broad and it's deep. So then what do I do? So what I do and what we've been doing in the last couple of years is sort of saying with the limited resources that we have, instead of doing a broad brushed uh, you know, analysis or policy analysis of what China is doing in Africa, let's sort of look at very specific 
um, countries and very specific sectors. So, so far we've looked at Chinese infrastructure development in Kenya and Tanzania. We've looked at Chinese um, uh, engagement in the agriculture sector in Zambia. We've looked at pharmaceutical manufacturing in Ethiopia and uh, mining in Zimbabwe, which was the recent project that just concluded. So in all of these projects, the effort has been to identify very specific case studies, right? So we uh, identify very specific assets, let's say, and um, within that, we, ident we interview different stakeholders and try and get like different perspectives, right? So how does that really work? For instance, if we look at the Zanzibar airport that we studied, we went to the field, we went to Zanzibar, we spoke to the Zanzibarian officials, we spoke to the Chinese contractors, we spoke to the Chinese subcontractors, we spoke to the Tanzanian officials who okayed this project, we spoke to the French consultant who works with the Chinese and the Zanzibarian as the middle point. So in different projects like these, like, in, like for instance in Zambia, we spoke to Chinese farms that were state-owned farms. We spoke to managers in privately owned farms. We spoke to professors and scientists from China who were working on these agriculture technology demonstration centers. And then we also spoke to the small company in Shenzhen that had come in with a drone technology to fight um, something called the fall armyworm infestation, which farmers in Zambia were having problems with. So the idea was to go on the field to talk to different people and to try and generate some new understanding or some new um, sort of ways of trying to understand how global China works at the grassroots. And this is where I'll sort of segue into how the fellowship has influenced it, right? Because if I look at the, the many ways in which um, the fellowship has sort of provided support and helped sort of mentor my uh, thought process, one of the most significant is the fact that while at Harvard, I was working with uh, Professor Jean Komarov, who's an anthropologist, right? And she introduced me to um, ethnographic research. And ethnography isn't a methodology which is conventionally used in inter international affairs, but she sort of introduced me to literature and to this framework where you could link the local and the global and why it was important to do that and how you could not just study a foreign policy of two states, but you can actually go down to the field and sort of let the study be, you know, upward looking, L look at it from the grassroots looking upwards and not uh, a traditional state centric lens that IR scholars usually take. So what she also did was introduce me to some methodology workshops. So at this point, when I started off my fellowship, uh, my biggest, um, I think, uh, weaknesses or the areas that I really wanted to work on, one was methodology, because I didn't think my training was strong enough. And the second was language. So what this fellowship did for me when I entered, when I gave the interview, uh, I did not have any Chinese language ability and the university that I came from in Mumbai, we didn't have a Chinese language uh, studying um, like opportunity, right? So what this fellowship did is they gave me a year and they said, okay, do, do HSK three year, like do, uh, they gave me three textbooks that I had to do and they gave me an exam at the end of it. How I passed that exam wasn't very conventional. Uh, a quick side note, I may or may not have found um, a Chinese teacher in Bombay who was Russian, but I'd spent 20 years in China, had married an Indian, moved to Bombay, didn't have any friends. So I'd just go to a house with these three books and we'd spend all day just either talking in Chinese or learning the Hansa. But anyway, so after that, going to China, when I did this fellowship, you did not have the first year of language, which I really wish I did. But uh, we had to immediately go into research. So then I started working with the uh, two foremost African scholars in China. Now, what that experience teaches you is largely, like most fields I would imagine, uh, I was very influenced, my worldview of the subject in particular was very influenced by scholarship from the West. So suddenly you're at an exceptionally vibrant Africa study center and there are delegations of African scholars or African experts coming in almost every week from different countries. And as the only Indian PhD uh, visiting fellow there, I was invited front row seats to all of these interactions. So, so to sort of see this from their perspective, to sort of see how they were framing the future of China-Africa relations, how they kept talking about the Tazara railway that was built in the 70s, a sort of, you know, a, a watershed moment in um, how this relationship was unfolding the areas that they were prioritizing and how um, they saw themselves uh, in this relationship. So the, the challenges of it, the, a lot of it, of course, I didn't agree. A lot of it I had questions about. Um, so it was a very 
way of looking at Africa that I hadn't sort of seen uh, before. And then um, another huge contribution, I think, uh, that the the fellowship did was sort of open up a repository of you know original collections and literature. So this this is this is a story that I often tell um, students when they uh, t- ask me if uh, they should apply for the scholarship. So when I landed in Cambridge, I gave myself two or three weeks to sort of get used to. Uh, uh, the environment and do all of the paperwork and everything. But a lot of the books that I read, including Professor Brottingham's book, uh, she thanked this particular librarian at the Fung Library called Nancy Hurst. So my first week there, I sent an email to Nancy saying, you know, I've, I've seen your name in all of these books. I'd love to come and meet you. Um, and immediately she replied. And then she said, tomorrow, 3 p.m., my office. And then she said, what is your area of research? Send me a paragraph. So I sent her a paragraph of the research I was doing. So I went to her office thinking in my mind, it's going to be a hi, hello, I'm a scholar. I'd like to come and you know look at the books in your library. But I went to her office and she had, and I'm not kidding you, like at three feet height, a huge line of books, not just from international affairs, but across disciplines of anything that had tangentially anything to do with Asia, Africa, right? And as soon as she saw me, she said, I've got your stuff ready. Let, let's find you a cubicle. And she picked up all these books, led me to a cubicle. And she said, all these books I'm keeping on the right. As soon as you finish reading one, put it on the left and I'm going to keep an eye on you to see how quickly you read, right? So it was, so I didn't even have to sort of go out there and do the literature review in this particular instance, um, right? It was sort of a support that was provided by the, by the fellowship and the institution. So I think what the fellowship then did is one living in China, traveling in China, to sort of study it as a student, which I think even if you later go for a conference or you go later as um, a visiting, I mean, you know, a visitor, I think it's very different when you are a student in university because you have opportunities to create relationships. Like I went to a Swahili class only because I wanted to meet more Chinese students, right? Um, and you can talk about China, not just from an intellectual point of view, but from really a young person's point of view, right? How do they see their country? What are their hopes for their country? How far have they come? Um, I remember going to a Chinese friend's house, her grandmother's house for New Year's, and it being a, a, a completely uh, surreal experience because I had five members of the family quickly come and tell me, you know, the grandmother, our grandmother has never probably seen an Indian woman before. She's probably likely going to say something that's going to be off color. So please don't take it personally. And then this old lady sees me and she starts like, um, you know, she starts, she starts looking at me very intently. And then she starts singing Avara Hu and says, you know, Chairman Mao used to play this in the radio when I was a kid and all of that. And she made me sit next to her at every dinner. She had all these questions about India. So in that way, it's a very immersive experience, although brief, a very immersive experience, which I think helps you create some context. Um, so then to the last part of my, um, to my presentation, why should you apply? I think the aim of ICS and HYI with the conversations that I've had, the idea is to create a vibrant cohort of China studies people in uh, India, right? And if you look at the different disciplines of this panel alone, I think you'll see that it's not so much disciplines. You are the host or you're the co-host? No. I think someone's. Okay. Um, I think uh, the priority is going to be on if your work is original or not, right? So irrespective of which field you come from, like we have someone who's studying science fiction to public health, to literature, to politics. As long as your work is exciting and it's original, I think you should definitely apply. And um, one thing that this fellowship gives you that others don't is that you have within one PhD program, the ability to inhabit different academic spaces. You have the opportunity to go to you have the opportunity to uh, uh, create relationships in very different ecosystems. And what this does is one, it helps you situate where the global discourse is in your particular field. And you can sort of then see where you come in into this larger global dialogue. And second, it gives you this platform, right, to introduce yourself to people in these ecosystems, which you otherwise just wouldn't have access to, not because of anything else, because you might not even know such people exist, right? So it gives you that platform to build these relationships and to maintain these relationships. And more importantly, it gives you access to uh, potential mentors and guides. Like, for instance, I would never have thought that a professor of anthropology would have such a huge role to play in my development as an IR scholar. 
But the idea that the fact that she sort of took me under her wings and introduced me to these alternate methodologies, I think really sort of influenced the work that I do today. And I think the best part about this fellowship, and I think everyone on the panel will agree with me, is that it is what you can make of it. Because most fellowships are pretty straight jacketed, right? They're very clear about what they want from you. They're very uh, X to Y. But in this case, what, what the onus is on you. What do you want to do? Which aspect of your research needs um, help? You can completely drive the agenda for this fellowship, which I think is uh, completely fantastic. And to sort of end, I've had some very young, um, uh, very bright young girls write to me uh, saying that, you know, but I'm not sure if I can do it. It sounds very complicated. It's, the Chinese is very hard or like living in China, like the food might not be good, all of these kind of questions. But if you are someone who struggles with imposter syndrome, like I may or may not, um, I would suggest just apply. It's not, you just take it one step at a time. You clearly have an entire group of people who are going to handhold you through the process. Um, I, I think the reality on the ground has shifted quite drastically since I did the fellowship. But even otherwise, the institutions that you're in, you have significant support. Um, and overall, it's been a fantastic uh, career-defining fellowship for me. So I urge you, if you are a student, if you're a graduate student, start thinking about a PhD, start thinking about this fellowship. If you are a PhD student, uh, the deadline, I think, is uh, in, in two weeks. So uh, put that SOP together. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Veda. Uh, we have uh, Tia coming in next. Um, well, let's have Madhurendra first. Then Tia, and then we'll end with Shanky. Come on, uh, Madhurin, up to you now. Uh, greetings to everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to apologize uh, because my presentation is not going to be as uh, coherent as uh, Veda's. Uh, reason being that uh, I had discussed this with um, uh, ICS that we are, our university had our second convocation today. And it's a very, it's a huge thing. And uh, as a faculty, I was really busy for the last two, three weeks. However, however, uh, I will speak about this fellowship uh, on the basis of what I have always felt about it. Since the day I uh, saw the advertisement to I got it. And since I have come back. Uh, if I'm not wrong, the aim of this presentation is to convince or to make more uh, researchers apply for this fellowship and tell them uh, that please do. Uh, it is a good, it is an amazing uh, fellowship. And I think I, I would like to say that uh, if ICS HYI starts charging to give this fellowship to the applicants, even that would be an exaggeration. I mean, why shouldn't when apply for this fellowship. This is the best fellowship that is available for researchers, for academicians who want to understand, who want to get deeper into uh, sinology or research in China studies. I'll, uh, I'll talk about myself. Uh, when I took uh, admission PhD uh, in JNU, I was already an assistant professor and I had worked for four years. In those four years, I realized that my natural interest in research lies in Chinese cinema. I come from uh, the field of Chinese language, literature, and culture. And in that, I realized that I would like to uh, specialize in Chinese cinema. Uh, then, of course, I got admission in JNU. And then I realized that uh, it is nobody's fault, but JNU did not have the infrastructure to guide me in Chinese cinema, even uh, School of Arts and Aesthetics. So to my utter surprise, they were talking about Japanese cinema. They had courses on uh, Iranian cinema, but Chinese cinema. And when I say Chinese cinema, I'm referring to mainland China. I'm talking about uh, Hong Kong also and uh, Taiwan, so greater China. Uh, it was absent. And then uh, I got to know about this fellowship and the fellowship was structured in a way that one year I could spend in China and one year in Harvard. And there also I was getting a choice. So first of all, uh, to be very honest, I was not sure that I will ever get this scholarship. So I was not sure. However, I wrote my SOP, my, I got my synopsis passed in time. And uh, uh, luckily for me, absolutely my great luck, I 
uh, got the uh, fellowship. And then I must say the way I approached research, the way I approached Chinese cinema, it changed. I went to uh, Peking University. I had a mentor in uh, Professor Li Taoxin. I told him my reality that, sir, I am, I know something about Chinese cinema, but I have never uh, studied it in a structured way. And uh, he took me under his wings and I was attending his uh, classes. I was attending his uh, lectures. He was sending me to uh, Peking Film Academy. He was introducing me to other scholars who were working not only on uh, cinema, but also on Indian cinema. And as a result, I also, uh, along with Chinese cinema, this cohort, they also started seeing me as a resource who can help China understand Indian cinema. And using those two years, I did make a space for myself, a very small space where I have also been helping Chinese scholars understand at least popular Hindi cinema. And I was eventually also able to publish research papers in uh, analyzing uh, aspects of Hindi cinema. So that happened only because of uh, this fellowship. And uh, I would like to share this uh, one information, uh, the research part. It, if, if I would not have been at Peking University and uh, accessing their Shanpao and uh, the, the archive, uh, as Veda just now mentioned that she had met a Chinese uh, uh, lady and she started singing Avara. And this is, and a popular understanding that the journey of Indian cinema in the context of China starts with Avara, Do Bhiga Zameen. So basically during the Mao period. And it was this research of mine, of Shanbao, which led me to this discovery. And with all humility, I would like to say that this is a discovery. It has not been done before. That Indian cinema went to China way back in 1930s, early 30s. And there were two films uh, the Light of Asia and Noor Jahan, which were being played in uh, the French settlement. And it was sort of a discovery. And even the professors at Peking University and uh, Beijing Film Academy, they, they got very excited. And they made it a point to uh, talk about it in their lectures that this discovery has come out. I have also talked about it in a small paper. Hopefully, um, someday, I would also like to carry a project uh, related to the journey of these films to China, how they were received, what were what was their journey. So, so this happened because of the fellowship. And after that, I went to Harvard, and it was a dream come true. Now here, I want to be uh, politically correct. I am not glorifying West. I am not saying that you know you become something only when you go to Harvard or Yale. No. I am in academics and when I went to Harvard, I realized that the grandness of academics could be seen there. And unfortunately, in India, there are very few universities. If you have studied from there, you would be able to see the grandness of academics. But then uh, you may forget it uh, that, oh, academic is such a grand field. I reached Harvard and I had tears in my eyes. I'm speaking from my heart is not prepared. It's not a prepared presentation. I could not believe that academics is such a grand field. And I, I can share this personal anecdote. I left the job uh, uh, of an attache in Ministry of External Affairs. And the moment I reached Harvard, I was proud of my decision. I, was, I did the right thing by leaving uh, MEA and shifting to academics because this is where academics has brought me. And it was because of ICS HYA fellowship. And I had a wonderful uh, 10 months stay at Harvard uh, collecting materials of related to my research as well as understanding that I I'll be going back to uh, Department of Chinese Studies, Doon University. So I, I, I must collect materials for uh, our department as well. And today, the kind of books I have in my collection, uh, my students, my colleagues, they feel surprised that, okay, you have this? Wow, how do you? And because I carried all those things from Harvard University, you go around the Harvard Square, the bookshops, they have such amazing books on China studies. And of course, I also scanned many because I couldn't have carried all of them back. And there, of course, meeting uh, Dr. Li Chie, uh, understanding Chinese cinema through her, attending her lectures, 
attending all the other lectures on Chinese cinema and cinema in general in Howard and how they were approaching, uh, how they were critically approaching uh, cinema, research in cinema, understanding society, history, politics through cinema. All these things helped me a lot. And I have been using it. I have produced papers. Uh, and hopefully, I'll be very soon submitting my uh, PhD thesis also. I feel, uh, I don't feel any, uh, I mean, I should have submitted it by now, but the moment I came back, I was made the head of the Department of Chinese Studies here in Dune University. And uh, of course, it was because of ICS HYI Fellowship that those three years were very productive because I was able to, uh, because of the contact I made through ICS HYI, I was able to use that contact and bring in scholars, researchers who uh, helped our department grow. So. Uh, so all this has been possible because of ICS HYI and my topic of research has been uh, analyzing the works of Chia Chang He through alienation theory. So what uh, this uh, fellowship helped me with that I was also able to develop this uh, interdisciplinary aspect. Otherwise, my understanding of Chinese uh, cinema would have been just limited to language, but the sociology part of it, it came in because of the audit classes, the research methodology classes, I was able to uh, attend in Peking University as well as uh, Harvard University. So uh, I don't know, I mean, if I'm making sense or not, uh, I it will be wonderful if uh, questions and answer uh, questions come to me later, and maybe I can uh, clarify myself or give a better uh, presentation then. However, I just want to say that this is a lifetime opportunity. Please don't let it go. Why shouldn't one apply for this? Please do. This is the best that is there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Madhurendra. That was uh, one from the heart, as you said. It was uh, uh, truly uh, nice to hear you speak straight out uh, because it's really uh, not, I mean, the heart, of course, uh, is a, a synonym for the passion which you bring to your field. And, and that's precisely what maxima uh, from what this opportunity is all about. And what you said about, you know, going to Harvard and feeling the grandeur of academics. Uh, uh, indeed, I, you know, it's the, the, the uh, something that I had uh, tried to convey in my, uh, in my opening remarks that, uh, serious research and serious scholarship is uh, is about going to the bottom of things. Uh, you dig deep. Uh, you don't spread out. You know, like uh, somebody said that uh, you uh, you cover a ground that is an inch wide but a mile deep. So it's depth, and that depth will only come when you are really truly obsessed with what you want to do. Uh, and feeling the grandeur, as you said, Mother Indra, in a university setting is all about the ability to be able to get fascinated with the world of ideas. That's what an academic space is all about. That when it is not facts which drive you, it's not facts which excite you, it's not compilation of facts that becomes a, your objective, but ideas the thrill that you get in the world of ideas. So this is what the HYI uh, will actually uh, enable you to. So here we have two very different uh, perspectives coming out. Uh, Tia, it's over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's so good to see you all after a long time. Um, I think, uh, thank you, Veda and Madhurinder. I think they have... Um, really given a good presentation. I'm very sure so many people are already convinced. What I am going to do in my presentation is I would like to spend a little bit more time on the structure of the fellowship, what spaces and opportunities were given to me, and how did I go about it, and like what did I get out of it? So I would spend a, just a minute on um, my research. Um, my research interest spans across public health, history of science, medical humanities, and social medicine. Um, 
uh, in my PhD thesis, I'm looking at the role of American foundations in public health. Uh, it's a China and India comparative with a focus on three American foundations, specifically the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Gates Foundation. I was selected for this fellowship in 2017. Um, I went to China and spent two whole years in China. So I want to spend a little bit more time on the China part here. Um, because um, that was, I felt, uh, one of the most enriching experiences of my life. Um, and that two years was what actually brought me, like, actually brought me deep into China studies, um, especially in the field that I'm working on. So in China, in two years, um, two years was divided into, like, three parts, that is, um, three universities. The first year I was at Wuhan at the Central China Normal University. In 2018 fall, um, I went to Fudan University at the Department of Chinese History and Civilization. And in 2019 fall, I was placed at the Center of the History of Medicine at the Medical School of Peking University. Um, so these three years, I want to divide it into sub points. And I just want to give the audience a um, few points on what is it that um, the multiple opportunities that you're getting as a scholar um, like while working in China, what is this like scholar, uh, fellowship specifically giving? First thing is flexibility. So I was given the choice to go to, the, to my choice of institution and with the people that I wanted to work with. I specifically wanted to go to Fudan because I wanted to uh, work with Professor, uh, Professor Kaoshi, who is also an expert in the area that I'm working on and um, at the Center of History of Medicine because I wanted to work with Professor Chang Taching and because there's this whole history, whole Institute of Medical Humanities at the Peking University Medical School. Um, so this was very interesting because I was very, very happy that I was given this chance to go and connect with the Institute that I've been wanting to and work with people that I have been wanting to about whom I have been reading about. Second is um, the language component. So um, as China studies scholar, um, language as it is given in the fellowship is a very, very, very important part of the uh, fellowship, but also as a China studies scholar, I think it's important that because like right now I'm working with uh, Chinese materials and the kind of information and in-depth insights that a uh, Chinese um, paper would give you, it's like it just brings a different light into your whole work. So um, in at Wuhan, where I was placed for a year, um, the Chinese language course was for one year. And by the end of the year, they, are, they would prepare you to sit for HSK4. Um, don't worry, even if you don't like pass four because it's a little difficult, you would definitely, like if you're giving your mind and heart to it, HSK3, you would definitely um, pass. Um, the structure, the teaching courses, the way they designed it, I found it very, very interesting. And that was my, as a beginner in Chinese language, um, that was my foundation. And I felt, um, I felt I was very lucky to be a part of that like whole um, series, uh, whole course. Second, at Fudan also, I continued my language. Um, so if, because I was enrolled in the history department, but you have the freedom to go and audit courses, Chinese language courses. Um, the only thing that one can do is go and seek permission from the teachers and the classes that you want to attend, and then you're free to sit and listen. So that was one thing that Fudan gave me, and even in Peking for that matter. So like you are doing your research, but at the same time, you are also learning the language, you are auditing courses. Um, and I felt like most of the teachers were very welcoming. And I don't think there would be anybody who would say no to you if you want to audit and like seek for those classes. Second, third thing is the repositories. So in the first year at Wuhan, Wuhan had a very large collection of um, specifically on missionaries and like medicine. And that was a very important part of my research because my first chapter speaks uh, specifically on the role of American medical missionaries in both India and China. 
and the repository at Wuhan has one of the best primary materials um, that you you can. So anybody who is interested in exploring that area, um, it that is a good place. And at Fudan, you have the um, Shanghai Central Library and Shanghai Municipal Archives. So um, if anyone who is working with any history and anybody who is interested in looking at manuscripts or primary documents, I think the municipal archives and the center, and those are very good places, even if you want to just go sit and work. Um, so I think it's very good opportunity if you're looking for any archival work um, that uh, you want to get hold of. The only thing that you have to do is get a letter from your department, sign it from your supervisor, and then you get the space to work. Um, even at Peking, the school collection was pretty good. The next point that I want to mention is networking. First is people to people networking and institutions. As a China studies scholar, being very new in China with like very, very little language, um, I had to rely on like my context. I had to rely on talking to people. Initially, I found it a bit difficult, but um, the kind my supervisor was very, very helpful. She's the one who connected me to all the different institutions that I went to and to all the different repositories or libraries that I visited. And like, um, she is also the one, the, the one at Fudan, Professor Kao, she was the one who actually introduced me to the school at uh, Peking. And because uh, the history of science and medical humanities um, uh, group is not a very big group, um, so they have a very tight network. So uh, she introduced me to those people and I think um, people to people networking and trying to meet people would really help you. And those are the kind of spaces that you get, which um, you would not get sitting here when you're able to actually do your field work. Uh, the second part in networking is the institutions. Um, through Professor Kaoshi and Taching, I was able to get connections to the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Beijing Union Medical College, which was also a very important part of my work, and the Fudan School of Public Health. So you go to different institutions, you meet different people, you talk to different people. That is the kind of space that this um, fellowship has given me. And I think that you would not get anywhere. The flexibility and the freedom and the, because you are an HYA, ICS HYA scholar. So that also gives you the space and the opportunity that people would, uh, I think, come forward to like be helpful that way. And uh, the last part that I want to mention is uh, because my uh, one important methodology of my work was key informant interviews. If you're going with the idea of interviewing people, I think people to people networking and institutions network, institutional networking that this fellowship would give you uh, and the space that this fellowship would give, I don't think um, uh, you would get it anywhere to be honest. Um, so that is why, how I was able to kind of navigate my interviews in China. Um, coming to Harvard, they have a very, very robust library collection um, I think, and um, the interlibrary loan sitting at Harvard, you can uh, you can lend a book from Yale, you know, from Stanford and all those kind of spaces. And you, if there's one thing that you don't have to worry about at Harvard is about materials or resources. You don't have to worry about that. You are at a safe place because in India, what happens is that sometimes half of our worry goes in like, Kaha se ye kitab and all that and all. So, but at Harvard, this was a very interesting um, opportunity and um, I was really blown away with the collections that they had like every like I think um, Veda and Madhurendra would also support me in that even Shanky uh, since he is there now they have the collection is just amazing the number of interesting courses because uh, at Harvard unfortunately the second semester of my Harvard was I spent the entire semester in lockdown so in, in the first semester, I was able to audit like four courses. There's so many interesting courses that are given that you really have to sit and just choose, okay, I cannot take this much. So I just have to take two and all. So, but those are the kind of spaces that you get. Those are the kind of spaces that you get. And what was really interesting to me is that I went to China with a public health perspective, but that really opened two years in China, opened my worldview, um, into China studies in a very different way that like 
now I'm like exploring history of science in China. I want to look at the SDS, um, uh, the SDS research in China. And like, uh, you want to also like explore other areas. So that kind of spaces you will only get when you're in the field. And I think being in the field for two years, um, only this fellowship would give you that opportunity. So, and lastly, um, I would just like to mention a little bit, uh, like a minute on my research work as comparative study India, China, especially in my field of area that is medical humanities, history of science is, um, I won't say it's unexplored, but there's so many interesting areas that are yet to be explored that I actually was, uh, that I actually found being in China. I found many interesting scholars who were interested in looking at India as well. And I think that is the kind of connections that you build. And right now, uh, what this fellowship, I just want to end by saying that what this fellowship actually given me is that it gave me a ground and a base um, to be in China studies. And I think now I know where, like, where I want to be. Uh, so yeah, I would like to end it. Thank you. Ah, thanks, uh, Tia, for, uh, yes, uh, another scintillating presentation, I must say. Uh, you see, here we have somebody who does not come from a China studies background. And that is really, uh, in many ways, symbolic of what this ICSHYI can do. Because it's, it, is, uh, uh, it, it, it opens up uh, the pathway towards comparative kind of work uh, of a kind which uh, maybe she would not have done uh, had she just been um, located within her own school. Um, and I think a, a lot of uh, key words uh, about ICSHYI come out of Tia's uh, presentation. I, I mean, look, look, look at the, the thing she's talking about. She's talking about the flexibility that this uh, scholarship gives you, the freedom that it gives you, uh, the space and the opportunity that it provides. Um, and above all, what she's really brought out very well is the the kind of uh, significance you yourself acquire um, and your belief in yourself as, as an ICSHYI scholar. You see, uh, something that we have really put our, uh, 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 our minds to and we give a lot of effort is the dialogue that uh, goes on between ICS and HYI in terms of where the student will be placed in China. Identifying uh, selecting, searching the right mentor and supervisor, because they are the keys then to opening up larger spaces. And so this process of uh, uh, locating the institution and the mentor, both in, uh, in, a, in an institution in China and at Harvard, uh, is something that really provides the kind of value addition. Um, and both, um, uh, in fact, all three have, uh, have pointed to how uh, their mentors actually opened up the, the... So thanks, Thea, and uh, we move now to Shanky. Um, I don't see him, but anyway, over to you, Shanky. Okay. Uh, am I visible? Yes, now not? you are up, right. Okay. So thank you, ma'am. And uh, I think that most of the important point, uh, points are like, they are already mentioned by Veda and Tia and even by the Madhurinder sir. So since most of the audience, they are the scholar who in future maybe apply or they are thinking for applying the same scholarship. So I already keep it in my mind. So my presentation is actually based on a three key point. That is that how I prepare myself for the scholarship, what I did in China and how I have, you know, uh, maximize the, the, what we say, the utilization of the scholarship in both China and the United States. So first of all, uh, thanks to the ICS Harvard ENG Institute Visiting Fellowship Program, I had an opportunity to study and live at Beijing Normal University for one semester and currently studying at Harvard 
from August 2021 till now. It was a dreamlike journey, an experience that I will cherish for a lifetime. I will start my experience with my PhD topic. I am a PhD scholar from the uh, Center for Chinese Studies, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. My research uh, interests include modern and contemporary Chinese science fiction. The title of my PhD thesis is Sociopolitical and Cultural Factors in the Making of Chinese Science Fiction, writer Liu Suxing, Understanding the Three Body Problem. So, this is a, one of the most uh, significant achievement in the history of Chinese science fiction that when in 2015, when Liu Cixin for his uh, remarkable work, uh, that is the three body problem won the Hugo Prize award. And that's how we know that, oh, the China, they have the science fiction too. So, so what is like, what is significant about that? So my main objective of my research works are the thematic analysis of three body problem written by the Liu Cixin, who is considered to be master of Chinese science fiction within the last four decades. The second point is like what makes Liu Cixin work so good that it is considered not only one of the most representative Chinese contemporary science fiction work, but also of world science fiction. An overview of the development of Chinese science fiction literature in China since the beginning of the 20th century and insight into how censorship can limit imagination and how this in turn can have a negative influence on the subsequent scientific advances and development for China as a new scientific power. So these are the basic key points which I'm looking and which I'm working on it. Apart from that, that earlier, in the earlier phase, of like uh, from the very beginning, uh, from 1949 till now, the science fiction was banned by the Chinese government uh, by the Chinese government for several times. and But now they are promoting why it is so. So one of the major points, apart from which I have mentioned here, is that this is the best literature they can offer to the world right now, according to the Professor David Wang from East Asian Department, Harvard, that this is the best quality of literature that China can avail to the world. That is the first thing. The second thing is that China is uh, like, China is very good at manufacturing anything. If somebody brings the plants and they can build anything, but they are very poor in terms of innovation and creation. So in late 2000, China covertly, they did a kind of survey and research. So they sent lots of people and scientists to, the, to America like uh, Lockheed Martin, then McDonald's and Cisco, Microsoft and Google. And they tried to find out that why they are very good at creativity and innovation. What they have found, which is quite interesting and shocking for the Chinese uh, government, is that most of the technocrats and their best scientists, they used to read a lot of science fiction in their childhood days. So nowadays, because China want to be a power, a innovative and the, a hub of innovation and creation, that's why the Chinese, they are promoting the science fiction in the mainstream you know, education system and everything. Because science fiction, more or less, it also plants the seeds of creativity in the mind of the youth and even the children. And the third point is that it is also a very good, what we say, it, uh, a kind of tool of a soft power as well, so that it can provide a very you know, technically advanced image of China, which is quite comparable, you know, com uh, you know, comparable with America as well in an international arena. So I'm also looking for the possible use of Chinese science fiction as a soft power tool and the feasibility of Chinese science fiction as a mode of teaching the Chinese language in India. So while researching a topic like this, I felt a sense of gap when it comes to the availability of the research material. All the Chinese science fiction has a long history, but in the Western world, a very little research work was available at that time. I'm talking about 2015, between 2015 and the 16. I remember that not more than 14 to 15 research articles and some online blogs, which with English commentary were available in 2016 and 17. Of course, it is a significant, uh, significant advantage and the major drawback as well because it's a new field of Chinese literature. Therefore, there's a huge research gap was available, but with few primary and secondary sources. To outline your research work with an appropriate theoretical framework is a very difficult task. That was the biggest challenge for me. 
So I went to my professor, Professor Heman Nutlakha, and consulted about my plans to do my PhD research on this topic. So my professor, he really works hard on my topic and outlines the whole theoretical framework for my science fiction studies in India. So in terms of a supervisor, I couldn't have asked for anything better. He's patient with me. He knows my shortcomings and he always motivates me even if I cannot see myself progressing. So having such a supervisor makes this journey very comfortable and easy. So he put more emphasis on theories because theories are the body of ideas and methods we use in the practical reading of literature. It is a theoretical framework that formulates the, the relationship between the author and the works. It also helps to develop the significance of race, class, gender for literary study, both from the standpoint of the authors uh, author's biography and analysis of their thematic presence within the text. So in my research, I'm using two different theories to prove my hypothesis. The first one is the Marxist literary theory because science fiction in particular imagines a change in terms of the whole human species. And these changes are often the result of the scientific discoveries and invention that are applied by human beings to their own social evolution. So these are also concerned of the Marxist utopian and the social imagination. The second theory I would say that I'm using is a psychological theory called the Erickson stages of psychological development in order to understand the author's socio-political and cultural environment. As I mentioned before, from the extremely poor ability of the relevant literature and primary and secondary sources, both online and offline on Chinese science fiction came in India. It is not easy to comprehend and understand the connection between literature politics and how it plays out in a fast globalization, globalizing China that is keenly pursuing international recognition in science fiction. Therefore, it is essential and relevant to get a feel of these dynamics in the Chinese settings. In other words, it will be a fruitful experience for me to pursue my study in Chinese university, which will, which will also provide a template for my field work. Moreover, it will also allow me to interact with Chinese science fiction writers, Chinese scholars, critics, and readers of the three-body problem, and assess the impact of the Liu Cixin and his Hugo Prize for science fiction in China. So the best way, like without any material, without any, you know, the primary and secondary resources, books and everything, and you don't have any, you know, you know, the first-hand, you know, personal experience about that, like, I'm not talking about the Western science fiction, I'm talking about a Chinese science fiction, which is completely alien to anyone, even in India. So the best way to get a chance to do my extensive research on this topic is to get an ICS HYS scholarship. As a result, I prepare myself for the ICS HYS fellowship, did an extensive reading, whatever was available at the time. And I made a very articulated, crisp and sharp statement of purpose for my candidature. It was a tough interview, but in the end, I was selected for this fellowship program. So uh, that was the part uh, which I want to mention for, for those who are preparing for their synopsis and uh, their statement of you know, proposal. A professor plays a very important role to articulate your research in a very good form. So I will, now I will share my experience in China, like uh, under the ICS HYL fellowship. As per my academy requirement, I was placed at the Department of Modern and Contemporary Chinese Language and Literature at the School of Chinese Language Literature of Beijing Normal University. So why I, why I choose the Beijing Normal University? Because my mentor, Professor Wu Yen, he was the youngest science fiction writer in China. And he was the first person who actually started the first undergrad program uh, in science fiction studies at Beijing Normal University in 1992. So actually this is the, what we say, we can say that it is a pioneer institution in the field of Chinese science fiction. So uh, I started my lecture, my research at the Beijing Normal University as a visiting fellow under the supervision of Professor Wu Yan. He helped me a lot and he invited me almost all the important Chinese science fiction events in China. Although the science fiction topic is quite popular in China, but 
it still comes under the children literature section uh, section like articles and journals about the time travel alternate history apocalyptic scenarios and military conflicts in near future types of subgenre are still missing or banned by the government therefore it's a bit difficult to find chinese science fiction as a different genre in libraries and bookstores so i tried to collect materials from the beijing normal university from chinghua university sichuan university peking university library national library at peking cnki science fiction magazine online and offline archives of different newspaper and after consulting with my advisor i visited the headquarter of science fiction world the one of the what do you say most famous uh, science fiction magazine in china so i visited to the headquarter of science fiction world chengdu sichuan for data collection i met the deputy editorial director chief uh, the editor of uh, chief uh, the science fiction world magazine mr yao hai hai chun he provided me a substantial detail about the science fiction development of china and a limited edition volume uh, of oral history about the chinese science fiction history and development i also have attended uh, attended the nebula awards for global chinese science fiction uh, in october chinese science fiction convention to in november and the fifth china international science fiction conference which is the which is the largest one uh in in chengdu and i tried to collect more data conduct in interviews and try to understand the current trends in the chinese science fiction i was invited as a member of a panel discussion by the science fiction world magazine and sichuan university science fiction association and the title was how do young scholar dissect science fiction in which i have discussed about the history and methods of the science fiction bridge between the china and the west my interest in chinese science fiction and the situation of science fiction in india including creation and research science fiction research trends and topics worthy of attention and some of the suggestion for the students uh, for the student who want to start science fiction research etc i was also invited for the chengdu asia con meeting to uh, to establish the first asian science fiction writer association i shared my opinion and suggestion and discuss the selection procedure and criteria for the science fiction representative from each country so i was the only person from the india who, who was actually representing uh, india in the science fiction what we say writer association i was also invited as a member of a panel discussion by the chongqing fishing castle center for science fiction summit forum and the title was philosophy of science fiction and science fiction of philosophy with mr li kuang yi the associate professor of chongqing university mr wu fei who is the professor of philosophy at beijing university and many other respective members in which i have discussed hobbes moral and political philosophy with three body problem and alien invasion theory the and so that is the what is my first three months in china were pretty busy i didn't get enough time to stay in beijing and i tried to attend some courses which is related to the academic chinese and some research methodology but it didn't work out so much for me because most of the time i spend outside the beijing to collect the research material to conduct the interviews of the author i met the author of the of the three body problem liu shixin and other famous chinese science fiction authors so it was a fascinating experience for me but quite hectic as well because i have to compile all the research material according to my you know research framework and everything so i want to discuss the the crucial role of the china, of knowing the chinese language in china and how you can you know utilize the the all the benefits of the scholarship so in doing research uh most of the primary resources are available and especially in my case are in chinese only so in addition i also conduct lots of interviews with the chinese authors and editors such as liu shixin the author of the three body problem mr hao yao chun the chief editor of science fiction magazine professor wu yan my mentor and mr fang chan the director of the fishing castle uh, castle science fiction college so all interviews i have conducted in chinese language so knowing chinese language can provide an advantage over other research skills in china you can discuss most of the research topics problems new trends in chinese with your mentor author and other research scholars from the china who are doing their research on more or less on the same topic knowing chinese can also provide an advantage of using public transportation in china since taxis are expensive as compared to the public transport therefore speaking chinese language can avail you an excellent experience of traveling and exploring the china in a very economical or in other words very student friendly way 
But the most crucial aspect of knowing Chinese is that it provides an advanced tool for doing covert and overt research in China. There are many subtopics where you can't find any publication or data. And for example, like uh, in 1982, the Chinese science fiction was banned by the government uh, uh, under the, the anti spiritual movement. So the official a statement by the government is that because the science fiction is pseudoscience, because, because the science fiction is anti-Marxist, spread the vulgarity, so that's why they persecuted a number of Chinese writers. For me, it's quite strange that it's not a very big deal that for that particular reason, you can persecute so many science fiction writers from 1982 till 1985. So I discussed a lot and I spoke to the many of the scholars and later on what I realized that the Chinese government is quite sens sensitive about the science fiction. And I was like shocked at why, why is it so? Because the Chinese government, of course, they are very careful. They think that if any science fiction writer from China or a Chinese science fiction writer, if in his work, because the science fiction is all about the futurism and the speculative future. So they are quite afraid of that. Uh, and if any science fiction writer- So Shanti Chandra, uh, yeah? already, uh, 15 minutes are up, if you could wrap up. Uh, it's, it's 15 minutes up? It's already 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. What, uh, what he's trying to say is wrap up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I would say that I utilize uh, what we say by Chinese language skills and everything. And uh, so it is very important to know the, the you know, to how to use uh, your language skills in China, especially for the covert and overt research. And I also deliver lots of lectures uh, about the Indian science fiction in China, in Chongqing University and in Beijing Normal University. So Till now, my experience at Harvard is quite fascinating. I think the Veda and the Tia, they already mentioned the advantage of the Harvard. They provide an excellent opportunity. The, the amount of stipend is much more than the living expenses. And moreover, you can access all the facilities which is available uh, in uh, uh, like uh, at Harvard. So the solid, you know, uh, what we say relation uh, with the ICS, and uh, between the ICS and the Harvard Yanqing uh, Institute will provide a golden opportunity for all the Indian scholars who are doing and who wants to pursue their research on the India-China related topics. So it's a golden opportunity. Please work hard for it. You have to work hard for it and don't try to miss this golden opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shanki. Um, I think we have um, we have a presentation here uh, from somebody who's obviously um, uh, totally into his thesis writing and thinking about nothing except his research. So he's uh, and uh, but if you heard uh, every everybody very carefully, I think many ideas have spun out of that. Uh, they have each in their own uh, ways um, given you uh, many avenues uh, coming out of these topics uh, which you could further uh, uh, explore. Uh, but um, thanks, Shanky, for uh, tipping your hat to the supervisor who plays uh, unsung, unheralded, a quiet role in the background, but plays uh, a big role in shaping uh, your work and so on. And as you can see, that the opportunity to go and deliver lectures, to talk to people, uh, means that you go there not just uh, wanting to study China, but immersed in your own experience, uh, which you can then convey. And then therefore, you know, that becomes a very important, you become an important resource there. So that's what comes out of uh, Shanky's presentation. Okay, now we're gonna open this up for discussion and then I will come and wrap up uh, at the end um, for, in five minutes. So if there are questions, um, whoever's handling the back end, can you please uh, see? Uh, Ma'am, we don't have any questions in the chat box. Uh, any hands raised? Not yet. Uh, Looks like they're they're sitting completely, you know, mesmerized, hypnotized, awed, completely at a loss as to what to say. I mean, that's uh, okay. Neha, Neha has put up her hand. So finally, okay, Neha, please uh, ask your question or 
say what you will. You unmute yourself first, Neha, and please say, yeah. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this detailed uh, presentation, which, which is like uh, inspiring me more to apply for this fellowship. And uh, uh, I have applied last, last year also, and I couldn't stop myself to apply this year also, because last year I was not in PSG. And uh, but the experience every year people share who are the fellows here, uh, it's really inspiring for me. And I really want to be the ICS fellow. So the, my only question is uh, about the postdoc. Uh, I have the concern about this, that if somebody who is a uh, um, ICS fellow and come back from this experience from China and Harvard, and wants to go for postdoc also. So like, do you, do the person, do the student has any commitment to stay in India and not go for postdoc for that some amount of time or not? Uh, or one can go and come back and do the required commitments. Just wanted to know this and uh, rest I got very detailedly. Thank you. Um, Veda, would you like to answer that since you were the first one and you came back and we had a huge discussion yeah. on this? Yeah. Yeah. So I think Neha, a um, couple of points. I think one, I'm not really sure if things have changed, but in my contract, it had said that I had to come back to India for one year and work in uh, a field, but um, in a field that is related to China and India. But um, Having had uh, an experience with the postdoc environment here, I can assure you that if you are thinking about coming back to the US, it's it, unlike India, it's an incredibly competitive uh, job market, right? So if you have just a PhD, you probably the odds. Uh, I mean, you put she odds. wants to uh, she wants to know whether you have to spend your time here before you can take up something. Uh, whether she goes here or there is uh, is yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm just coming to that, ma'am. I was just. Uh, I think the new contract says you have to be in India for two years. In my time, it had said one year. But I'm saying that it actually works out well because the two years that you do come back to India to finish off your PhD and to do some extra research is just going to add to your uh, toolkit when you apply for a postdoc. So um, I think the quick answer is yes, you have to come back to India. But again, I wouldn't see that as a bad thing. I would just see it as an opportunity to add to your repertoire uh, when you apply for postdocs. Does that answer the question, ma'am? Uh, yeah, I, I, since I will be addressing this at the end, uh, we'll leave it for now. Uh, Neha, okay. uh, unless you uh, are uh, even more confused than before you... Uh, is it all right? <laughs> <laughs> what say you, Neha? Okay, maybe we, we'll bring, him, bring her in. I saw Rohit raising his hand. Um, so Rohit, uh, please ask you, unmute and ask. Hello, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes you are audible, Rohit. OK. So uh, first of all, very good yes, evening Rohit. to everyone. And thanks for this informative session. I'm definitely applying for this fellowship. Uh, uh, yet my uh, whole of the documentation process uh, for PhD registration is not completed. So I haven't applied, but I'm going to apply within a week. Uh, I, my question is that basically I'm a student of uh, religion and history. Uh, I'm a student of Chinese Buddhism. I've completed my master's from Delhi University with a specialization in Chinese Buddhism. So what I uh, found the difficulty in India is there's a lack of materials, reading materials, especially in Indian libraries. Currently, I'm sitting in a Bihar and uh, uh, believe me, I'm not finding enough materials to read or review the literature. So how is gonna uh, how is that that fellowship gonna help me? If any of the panelists please answer, because that's my biggest worry right now. Um, well, uh, anybody can. I mean, just uh, jump in whoever wishes to feel. See now, now the thing, uh, Ruhit, which I am not quite uh, clear when you say that you're not getting any material sitting in Bihar. So obviously there is a lack of material there and you have to go to where the materials are. Now, assuming you're working on Buddhism 
uh, you make a trip to Banaras, you come to Delhi University, Delhi University has a good repository. So you have to go to places. Now, of course, pandemic restrictions and all, but once they start lifting up, uh, you know, especially when you are working on archival material or historical sources, you have to go to the source. Uh, so that is not uh, something that anybody can really help. Uh, but yes, once you avail an opportunity like ICSHYI, you'll be sent to a place where you will get materials related to your, your topic. So, uh, so you basically that's the point that you have to go and find out where the sources are, see if interlibrary loans are possible, um, and, and get your material. That's Thank one of the Thank biggest challenges in research. But if anybody else wants to answer this. Mm, I want to ask you that, uh, what is your topic? What is your, uh, you know, field of specialization? I'm working on uh, monastic economy and its impact on Buddhism in Tang Dynasty, China. So, okay, so the, the one of the best source you can get it from is the CNKI. And uh, maybe I think that the J stories is nowadays also not available. The best thing you can do is that you go to the Shanti Niketan in India, if it is possible, because they have a huge collection of the Buddhist texts and everything. The second thing I can offer is that uh, one of my colleague uh, from, uh, uh, is from Peking University, uh, Mr. Wang Kang, is also working on the Buddhist, uh, you know, sutras and everything. So you can take my email ID from the ICS and send me an email so I can try to collect some material for you so that you can, you can, you know, proceed with your, with your research synopsis and hope for the best. Thank you. Thank Rohit, you. Are, you, uh, are you a Chinese language knowing person? Sorry, ma'am. Are you, do you, uh, are you familiar and use the Chinese language for your research? I'm learning, slowly learning, ma'am. I'm not familiar very much. And you're looking at Tang Dynasty sources. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, that's that's a big challenge up ahead. Uh, but when you talk to Shanky, I think you should address this issue as well. Neeraj, you have put up your hand. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a question. Like uh, most of the speakers, they talked about uh, that they uh, did their research on development cinema and different different aspects of medical. So ma'am, my question is like, uh, I'm interested in security, like India, China security perspective. And my research interest mostly lies on maritime security issues and challenges in, in, the, in, in the Indian Ocean. So ma'am, uh, like suppose and I'm even pursuing my PhD on that. I'm in the first year. So ma'am, I want to know like uh, mostly, you know, most of the topics and research areas are covered on that aspect. So can it, uh, you know, uh, like suppose if I want to apply for this scholarship, can it be considered for that? Like, because, you know, we have a conflicting ties with China because I mostly read and write on that only mostly. So ma'am, I just want to confirm and just want to have a good idea about that. Like, can it be considered for that? And secondly, ma'am, uh, like right now, uh, I have been uh, interned and uh, holding different, different positions from different think tanks, but I am not uh, right now associated with ICS Delhi. So is it uh, like uh, compulsory to be a part of ICS, like if I want to apply? And third part is, ma'am, I am learning Chinese from St. Stephen's right now. So uh, like, uh, will it be a helping uh, thing like in the future, like if I apply and all that? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, the, the, the least uh, significant question will be answered. Um, that is, you don't have to be in ICS. You don't have to be part of ICS. You just have to be somebody who is interested in studying China and you apply. So uh, please don't think that only those who are affiliated with ICS, you look, you look at the entire galaxy of our ICS, HYI scholarship uh, uh, holders, and you will see that not all of them by no means, even the majority were associated with ICS. Okay, so that's number one. Uh, number two to your first question. Look, no topic is taboo. You submit any topic, the topic, your research proposal will be assessed on its own merits. Okay. Now, that's what uh, briefly I had made that point and I will once again come back since I feel that there would be a lot of people who would be looking at the India-China equation and clearly 
the overhang of the current situation uh, will will somewhere be working on them also. Uh, so the the point is not that this topic or that topic is not acceptable. All topics are acceptable. The key challenge is: is your proposal interesting, research worthy, capable of uh, constituting? Uh, a significant conceptual issue as well. Okay, if you're just going to talk about India China fighting each other, and this one said that, as I said, that it's not about factual research uh, that, uh, that uh, this scholarship is all about. It's about ideas, concepts, theories, which will form the foundation, the basis of your research. Um, the last bit you said was that you don't have much experience, and that doesn't matter. You just have to formulate a research proposal which will send us all into a tizzy and say, oh, wow, the best proposal that we've had. Take him. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, so now we have Nirmal. Um, Neha wants to come in later with another question. So Nirmal, your question? Namaskar, ma'am. You already asked a question. Uh, no, ma'am. I have not asked. Rohit has no. asked. Ah, okay, Nirmal. Go ahead. Okay. Na yeah. Namaskar, ma'am. Uh, namaskar. Bolye, Okay. Ma'am, I am very fond of Nirmal. I am undergoing my PhD first year from uh, DU, Department of uh, Discussion Studies. So my question is, uh, are, are there any options available for serving officers also for this scholarship? Because I, my, my research question or my interest is to find out the ways uh, how we can make it easier, the learning of Chinese language for non-English, non-native learners. Like most of the learning, all of the basis is romanization and then through English. But I think learning it through Indian languages and the, the mother tongue is easier. Uh, so something on those things. All right. Uh, so Nirmal, uh, see the point is that this is a scholarship for pursuing a PhD program. In other words, you have you are uh, enrolled in a university, you may not have got confirmation in the PhD program, but you are well on the way. That is, in other words, you have a proposal which you are submitting uh, for admission to the PhD program, but you are located within a university. Uh, the second thing is that your proposal, which will obviously lead to a PhD degree, uh, has to be uh, within the kind of uh, domain uh, that you are located in. So if you are, for instance, enrolled in the SIS in JNU or in the Department of East Asian Studies in, uh, in um, DU, uh, and you're working on something like, you know, which is fundamentally a linguistic issue, um, well, then the point will be about how, how well you are able to, to, uh, to conceptualize your research problem. Uh, for that, you would need help uh, from somebody who is uh, an expert in linguistics. Um, you know, so so the point really here is that you have to look at it as a scholarship to pursue a PhD in a particular domain. And as long as you can get that in place, then of course your proposal is what is going to uh, be the basis of the the selection. Right, Neha said she had another question to ask. So Neha, you can come in with your question now. Yes, <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, uh, the postdoc question is clear to me. I was okay. just confused about the, the years after coming back. So, and the other question I just have is, uh, Dr. Veda mentioned that uh, when she got uh, selected, she had to spend one year for the Chinese learning, language learning. So if like I have HSK2 level learning uh, already, so if I have it, so do I have to go through the language training again? Or like if, uh, would it be okay? Like whatever learning I have taken from uh, Indian University, Indian school, Lengma School of Language and other university. So just wanted to know this and this is clear. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, um, look, the thing is that HSK2 or you've got some, let's say a basic, uh, you've done a basic BA degree in Chinese language, uh, that's fine. You know, when uh, 
you send your proposal and if it is shortlisted for the interview when you come to the interview you are asked questions in chinese uh, the experts sitting there assess your proficiency they look at the uh the 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 ease with which you could negotiate the kind of texts you may have to consult so the mere fact of hsk 1 2 3 is is not uh, important it is also uh, how you are able to convince uh, the experts uh, in the selection committee about your familiarity your ease your mastery over the uh, over the language because if you are uh, doing a, a topic which which requires a really um, strong kind of uh, uh, language capabilities and you just done hsk2 or something then you know that that does create a bit of an issue though as i said that there is a scope that you are your your topic is so um, so exciting that you are selected you are given time to uh, hone your language skills further and then you go to china and we also have this provision that we um, talk to I, uh, hyi and give you some further language training in china yeah yeah so so there are yeah veda i just wanted to come in and say neha maybe you were confused because uh, our timelines were different for people on the panel itself so because i was the first batch i think we were still sort of figuring out the, the how the fellowship would work so there was no option for me to go to wuhan and spend a year of language training right so that's why i had to spend a year um, getting to some level of proficiency before i went for my year of research in china so since then uh, i think a lot of us we've been we had uh, written a lot of letters to professor perry and we sort of made a case for why they needed to be a year exclusively for language training so that's why you know Dia could go and do one year of language training and then research. So um, it's not. Uh, it's it was just a different format back then. So there's no need to be confused. Like Ma'am said, if you don't have Chinese uh, language capabilities, you will spend the first year just working on language. The second year, like everyone mentioned, you will pick out um, a university and a professor that you want to work with, which will just be for research, and then the year at Harvard. So that's the format now. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Uh... Vijay, Colonel Venkat, are there? Is there anything I'm looking at the chat box? I don't see any. Ma'am, can I just add one more thing? Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we need to wrap up now in the next minute or two. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I just had one point for anyone who is working on their SOPs. So a couple of you mentioned um, Chinese professors and Chinese universities. I think when you write the SOP or at the interview, uh, you have to. I mean, it would be very good if you can cite some Chinese professors in your SOP, right? Um, the question is i think a fundamental question is going to be how are you going to benefit from your time in china from a research point of view so you have to be at least um, you know you have to be cognizant of who are the professors who are working in your field what are they you know what is their um, line of thinking or uh, what do they add to the discourse and how will you and how will your particular project gain from that time in china that i think has to be clear in your sop as well as in the interview because i remember being asked that right you could do this or i i remember even being asked why would you want to spend a year at harvard if you're studying china africa where does the us come into this so i feel like you need to spend, dwell on that a little bit like how very specifically your particular sop is going to uh, benefit from a year in china and uh, harvard yeah. okay thank you uh, veda for that uh, so if there are no more questions i'm going to quickly wrap up because we've reached almost the end of our time uh, just uh, three or maybe four points that i would like to um, like to discuss now one the first of course when is is about what do we what what are the issues that we need to focus on when we uh, when we are thinking about research and uh, about a doctoral uh, research in china, on china now when liz perry came to us in 2014 um, and gave us this absolutely i mean there was jab and jacob with me and i we just simply couldn't believe our 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 ears and and she was very serious and she said that you know we've been looking at at the kind of uh, group that you have here and we are very keen that we start this initiative uh we had to explain to her the nature of the indian um university system the way in which china studies is structured here the limitations the problems uh and the fact that uh, we have unfortunately in this country uh, a system whereby 
studies and language are completely divorced uh, in the majority of the cases. Now, newer centers are beginning to at least uh, bridge that gap. They are including language, but uh, also tying up with uh, other places. For instance, now uh, Taiwanese are becoming a very, very significant source of language training for us. And they are also tying up with very a lot of universities. So we are trying to bridge that gap in many, many ways. Um, now, the point is that uh, we also have a problem about the way in which the PhD program is structured. And so, uh, very often we find our scholars are depending more on, because again, we are talking about studies, Western language sources, Western uh, scholars, and more towards policy orientations. And this is where we've always had a problem with, uh, not a problem really, but we, we've had to uh, discuss this out with, uh, with our counterparts in HYI, that uh, uh, unfortunately, the bulk of the students do go in for international relations, stroke, um, uh, foreign policy kind of subjects. And, but gradually over a period, we have tried to actively go and pull people out. Uh, so in other words, we are not uh, bringing China scholars specifically and putting social science into them. We are bringing social science people and putting China into them. Uh, so this is one thing that you must uh, bear in mind that topics need to be research worthy. And by itself, while policy decisions and policy issues and policy oriented topics become uh, important for a country like ours, but uh, they need to be also located within some kind of a theoretical or a conceptual framework. And so that is something that we need to bear in mind. But now there is another new element which has entered the scene. And I think as all you boys and girls out there, understand that the, the situation is fast changing uh, in uh, where we find that uh, uh, Shanky had mentioned uh, sensitive topics, you know, that uh, there are topics which, which will not be, which will not go very far um, simply because of the hurdles that the governments may put, whether here or in, in China. Uh, I was li listening to a discussion among some American academics the other day, and they said they're actually now tailoring the kind of topics for research uh, because they know that uh, this is not going to fly very far in China. Uh, my own students are wanting to work on, uh, there was one, somebody who came, uh, one person who just joined, she's talking about advocacy groups and the domain of human rights in China. And I said, but you know, <laughs> this will not take you into China and you can't sit and in India and do something like that. So the point is that um, while it is unfortunate, we need to now think in terms of topics that are, uh, that can be done. You know, George Bernard Shaw's lines come back to me. He says, uh, remember the lines of Cashel Byron. He says that um, for no fair youth that in the star crossed world, and this is a pretty star crossed world we are in right now, that fate drives us all to seek our chiefest good in what we can and not in what we should. Now, I'm not therefore saying that you dilute your research, your, but I'm saying pick up topics which are interesting, which are original, and there are plenty of such topics there, but which you can pursue, uh, which you will not have problems pursuing in China, which you will not have barriers put up or material is not available, etc. So that's really the first broad thing that think of your topic with some degree of creativity, some imagination, and, and, and there's plenty of stuff out there. And we're all there to, to help you uh, negotiate what you're... Uh... The second about the language, and I must again urge that you take the language very, very seriously. Uh, if not just for the scholarship, but for you may or may be very few lucky ones get the scholarship, you may, you may not get it. But if you're pursuing China studies, your language is going to be your biggest asset. More and more and more, I find uh, that uh, language is now becoming, uh, and there are many now people coming out with the language. Uh, so you have many more opportunities. Uh, I would say that uh, 
you know, the Dickensian touch. This is the best of times and worst of times for research. The opportunities that you have now are so immense, both for learning the Chinese, for access to materials. Uh, Nirmal, unfortunately, will not get Tang Dynasty materials so easily, but you have sites where you get books. You have, you, in, in the worst of times, because there's so much of material, so much of information that you need to now know not what you have to read. That's easy. You have to now know what you must not read because you cannot overload yourself with so much and, and then uh, try to make sense of it. So the use your opportunities, use your access to materials wisely. And for that, you need guidance and supervision. And please, therefore, bug your supervisors to death. Get them to tell you what you should and what you should not uh, be negotiating and reading. So that's that's very important. Now, the last point that I'd like to uh, come to is really about the university system, research, academics in India. All the scholars who have uh, so far got this scholarship and uh, those who are in the process of applying, remember that this core that I mentioned earlier about coming out of the Indian university system, availing of this fantastic scholarship, which gives you time in China and the US, and then coming back. That is, that is the cycle that all of you must do. Because if anybody of you has, I mean, all of you are coming out of the Indian system, but anybody of you who's been teaching in a, in a Chinese, uh, in, a, in an Indian university is teaching Chinese studies will know what the challenges are. Madhurendra can tell us, you know, I mean, he goes to Harvard and he says, wow, why? Because he knows the reality of the Indian university system. And, you know, the point is that the ICS HYI scholars are going to be the stars in the Indian firmament. And so we want you to build your career based on this excellent input that, you're, that you will get into your research. But this building of your careers has also to be taken with this strong need to raise a new generation of scholars. Your, it is your duty now to raise the next generation armed with the kind of insights and the advantages that you've got. So, all you young scholars and all those who have come from this, please remember this vital duty that you need to do to invigorate, energize, improve, strengthen China studies in this country. By all means, take up opportunities when you do get them. But don't forget that somewhere our biggest challenge is going to be understanding this, this behemoth, this rising power and, and really uh, though we have much many more people, China is still a black hole as when it comes to understanding its society, its culture, its people, you know, these, 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 the inner kind of dynamics of what makes China what it is. So, so the ICSHYI is for scholars who want to understand China. And I would uh, in conclusion say that there could be many questions that would still be unanswered. Um, so we have decided to identify two points people from this panel. Um, Veda and Madhurendra have kindly agreed to, we will put out their email uh, emails. Uh, if anybody wants to ask, we are also going to put out an, uh, an FAQ on our website so that you know, that could at least be the first point. But if any of you have any questions, any kind of doubts, uh, please do immediately write. Uh, I, I do remember this, this thing about uh, having to be uh, spending two years after the scholarship becoming a big kind of, you know, that is if some kind of a bonded for life kind of a thing. Some people saw it like that. So these are the doubts that we would like to dispel. And uh, so, Veda and Madhurendra will be happy to answer any kind of problems that you have. You can just uh, send them mails. And in fact, I would also suggest that do not hesitate to call on the ICS community. And we have a big community now. Uh, through the Institute, we can put you in touch with people who can help you write your research. Um, the important thing is that you think about the, what you want to do uh, seriously. 
And on that note, I will thank my panelists uh, once again. Uh, excellent, scintillating, from the heart presentations. Uh, we are all very proud of this entire cohorts who have come over the years. And we are very glad that the Harvard Yenching Institute has, has considered this arrangement valuable enough to continue. Uh, we hope they will keep this, uh, this thing going for, for still some time because we need it. We need it very badly. And so I thank the Harvard Yenching and I thank you all um, and good day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.